So welcome to the Global Network webinars. So my name is Alexander Loschke and I will be moderating this webinar today together with my colleagues Sean Lovell and Panya Yu. Uh, we have today with us Pau Garcia, who is a media designer and founder of Domestic Data Streamers. Um, Pau will present on the artificial ignorance and probabilistic stories, and I hope with this title we made you all uh, curious about uh, his talk. He will discuss the ethical considerations of utilizing artificial intelligence in creative industries, exploring its power to produce both astonishing potential and dangerous consequences. He will examine how artificial intelligence can have unseen impacts and the responsibility of creatives to ensure the safety of their work and the people they work with. So let me introduce quickly Pau. Pau is a media designer and founder of Domestic Data Streamers. Since 2013, this Barcelona-based studio has been producing immersive info experience for institutions like the United Nations, Tate Modern and Citizen Lab. Garcia is chair of the Master in Data in Design at El Sava, the School of Design and Engineering in Barcelona, and has featured and has lectured, sorry, at the Hong Kong Design Institute, the Royal College of Arts, the Politecnico di Milano, and the Barcelona School of Economics. Pau is also founder of Hey Human, an artist residency program that combines music, journalism, data for art research, and social justice. Before I hand over now to Pau, uh, let me just uh, make two remarks. We will first hear the presentation before we will have the Q&A session at the end. So please feel free to write comments and questions into the meeting chat at any time. During the Q&A, uh, we would prefer if you ask your question yourself, so uh, to create a more interactive atmosphere. As always, this Global Network webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the Global Network of Data Officers and Statisticians at yammer.com slash unstats. We invite you to continue the discussions on the Global Network after the webinar. And now I will hand over to Paul. Paul, uh, thanks for joining today. Uh, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much and, and thank you for having me here. Um, well, hello everyone. I'm, I'm Pau Garcia. I'm one of the founding partners of Domestic Data Streamers. I will share my screen. Let me know if you can see it well now. Yes, we can see okay. the screen. Great. So, uh, um, well, today I will talk about a couple of concepts. The first is artificial ignorance and the second is probabilistic stories. And those concepts are very much based in part of the research we are doing in our studio. Our studio, as Alexander said, is based in Barcelona and we are a team of, of 25 from coming from arts, uh, design, code, journalism and, and data science. And we all work together in over 45 different countries. Uh, creating all kinds of artifacts, devices, uh, exhibitions, digital tools and research, always focusing uh, on data and how data can transform inputs into outputs in different manners. And, and to kickstart the, the kind of way we see and experience information uh, today, I wanted to share an example and a story that I, I found uh, a couple of years ago when we were preparing an exhibition on video games and and i was looking up for of course video games that i was interested in from my childhood and one of them was calling my rally um, it was for xbox and playstation and it was like very quite a, an average standard video game from this time a race video game and i was looking through the comments area of this youtube video uh, talking about this video game and i found that story that uh, i felt it was really really moving and it was the story of a kid uh, that explained that when he was 
four years old, his his father and, and mother for Christmas, they 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 gave him as a present uh, this video game. And he started to play a lot with his father. It, it was kind of a bonding moment with them. And and it was through like this relationship with this video game that they started to like spend more time together. And and sadly, when when he was over eight years old, uh, his father passed. And and because it it reminded him a lot to his father, he could not play anymore to the video game. So he just stopped playing to it. And it was not until he was 27 years old that he came back uh, one day to his mother's place and and he rediscovered the video game and said, well, what, what will happen if I play it again? And he started to play with the video game, he alone, and something weird happened, something odd. That was that when he was playing, he saw that there was kind of a ghost car. And and this like very a pretty standard thing that happens in these video games that is the that the best lap, the best uh, race that you have done is recorded in the video game, in the memory, as another car. So you can kind of race against yourself. Right? The thing is that when he was seven and eight years old, his father was always winning to him to this video game. So he unexpectedly, with 27 years old, he was playing again with his father. And for me, it was quite a, a moving moment, if not one of the most interesting stories I have uh, heard on video games. Not because what it was, that it was, of course, emotional and moving, but because it was somehow a representation of the data that was forgotten. And it was a, such an intense and emotional representation and manifestation of data uh, that no, no one from Xbox, uh, PlayStation, or Colin McGrath Rally, none of the designers and coders of these video games have ever thought of. Right? And, and this is the kind of information we are interested of at domestic data streamers. Uh, because sadly, the way we experience and experiment and, and process information today is something more similar like this. And when we see headlines like the cost of corruption in Europe, up to 990 billion lost annually, our brains are not truly wired to understand what is behind these figures. Like we don't understand which is the difference between 600,000 billion or 990, right? Um, so this creates by itself, by this lack of comprehension, a lack of empathy. If we don't understand anything, if we don't understand something specific, we cannot get angry. We cannot uh, want to move from that situation to another one, right? And with this lack of empathy, generally comes a, comes a lack of action. If I don't understand something, I will not get angry at it. If I don't get angry at it, I will actually not do anything to change it. Right. Uh, so for the last 10 years uh, at Domestic Data Streamers, we have explored and experimented with different ways to transform information uh, from museums to institutions to schools, always bringing this information into the physical realm with so many different devices and artifacts. And uh, some, most of the times we have always tried to use metaphors to transform information into something that was already close or similar to what we were experiencing in our day-to-day -day life and trying to show information with our bare hands even. And showing that information is not only something static, something that you can look and comprehend, but it's something that is actually moving. This is uh, part of an exhibition that we did at Summer Festival last summer. And, and this visualization that you're looking at uh, right now is a visualization of the amount of earthquakes, earthquakes that happen in the world um, every two minutes. Right? And, and we did something similar with the amount of emails versus the letters that were being sent. And this idea of transforming data and information into something not that is not only visual by itself, but that is something that is alive, really changes and and pushes our perception of information and data into another level. These are what we call data creators. These are uh, kind of artifacts, uh, kind of with a lot of personality that were visualizing and representing information um, from all kinds. So we were kind of doing a cartography of the amount of edits on Wikipedia in real time um, through a whole month or the activity on WhatsApp uh, through the different days of the week. and 
by doing so, by doing all these installations and building up these landscapes, what we aim to do is to create cartographies, understanding that information is not only the quantitative aspect of it, it's not only the numbers, it is not only about the statistics, it's also about all the emotional layers and cultural layers that are embedded into a specific data and fact, right? And showing that this information is not only talking about the others or the world, but is also talking about yourself. So that's why in a lot of our projects, we always try to aim the audience as part of the statistic, as part of the information that we want to visualize. And this is just a se several examples of the projects we are doing in, in domestic data streamers uh, that are somehow pushing this idea of how we can transform data into a new language, into a language to comprehend the world, to comprehend uh, a new perspective and to better create spaces and bridges for connection and empathy. Uh, today, although I will talk specifically about all the work we have been doing during the last two years uh, with generative models on artificial intelligence. And for doing so, I wanted to introduce this concept that is called artificial ignorance, right? Um, and to start with this concept, I wanted to point out that uh, artificial ignorance is something new that come, comes with the idea of creating artificial intelligence. And it was, I think, somehow a very similar moment to the expansion of the printing press, at least here in Europe, um, because we created something new that it was expanding a lot of knowledge and sharing it and, and creating a lot of potential. But at the same moment, it was creating a lot of unlettered people. Before, if you were not able to read, that was not a problem because there were no so many books to read. But now you were surrounded by potential spaces of knowledge that you could only access if you knew how to read. Uh, so today we have something similar with artificial intelligence. We are building up really interesting tools, uh, but we are also creating the potential for a big space of ignorance and abuse, uh, a space for which in this technology can grow without a lot of people knowing which are the consequences and how it actually works. Right. So through like this kind of boom that we have lived through the last uh, two years of artificial intelligence, specifically generative models, we have seen two very polarized uh, spaces. No one saying artificial intelligence is inherently bad, unethical, and it will probably end up killing us all. And, and we have on the other side, uh, this very naive uh, Silicon Valley focused perspective, uh, artificial intelligence is good and it will solve all our problems. And we have like, really kind of important people, people with a lot of voices um, speaking from each of these places, from Yuval Harari saying that it will be the end of civilization to Ray Kurzweil saying that this is not a problem, that this is actually the solution of all our problems. And I'm more interested in what happens in between, in the, in the shadows, in the in the spaces between these positions. And we see people like Kate Crowdford or Holly Herndon totally exploring from a very critical perspective how to engage with these technologies and what is pl plausible and also factible. And, and this is probably the most important question that we should ask ourselves. What is a probable, plausible, and desirable future for the use of artificial intelligence, right? But before doing that, we first need to understand what artificial intelligence is. And this is one of the main challenges uh, we have encountered when talking and working with different organizations all over the world. And for me, I think a moment that I truly realized about the limitations of artificial intelligence was when I was reading an article at the Times uh, from Noam Chomsky. Uh, I, I don't need to present and introduce this, this uh, amazing character, but I, he kind of pointed out three main ideas that really stayed on me. The first was that the, the origins of artificial intelligence pursued the understanding of our own intelligence. It was a, an idea of creating a human-like intelligence. And lately, in the last 20 years, uh, and 30 years, there was a more pragmatic approach to these models and to this technology that was not focused in the understanding of our own intelligence, but in the creation of a total different one, basically focused on statistical prediction, right? And, and Chomsky somehow criticized that as a very short sight perspective, right? It says artificial intelligence will know very well when it's gonna rain, but 
we still need methodologies to know why it's going to rain because artificial intelligence will not know that, right? Will not understand the cultural um, value of the rain in certain territories. Will not understand a lot of contextual information that makes the rain important for us, right? Um, so to summarize it in a very simple way, uh, artificial intelligence models today, generative models, they are essentially machines for ma matching patterns, right? Whether the output is true is not the point, so long as it matches the pattern, right? So it's not, again, about saying something that is true, it's something that is probable, right? And, and this is at the basis of the technology we're using today, and this is what uh, actually changes a lot the perception when you are using this technology, understanding that this is not about truth, this is not about creating something that is always the two plus, uh, plus two is four, uh, but is probably is four, right? Um, and to give examples of that, we can see, like we have been using this technology for a long time. Now this is a conversation with a dear friend of mine, Yolanda, and, and, and this technology has been used for text prediction for a long time now, more than six years. And, uh, and this is just like, calculating the, the the letter that will come after the letter that you have right right and if you extend that prediction you can start to predict not even words but sentences and after sentences paragraphs but at the end again these are just estimations and the same is happening with image generation and um, what we are building up are um, models and fill them up and training them with clip and diffusion models that understand what a blue cube is, for example. And it, whenever you write a blue cube, it will create a new one, right? a new generation based on the ma matching patterns from all the database in which it has been trained. Right? Um, and of course, the, the effects of these are really, really interesting. Whenever you are trying to generate images and you write something like a realistic image of an indoor Abandoned video rental store. Olympus OM 1N, Zuiko 85.2, Kodak Gold 200. Here I'm already like pointing out the camera that I'm using, the film that I'm using, uh, the optics, and it truly creates an images that match all of this description. So it's it's becoming something that is really, really effective in terms of image generation. And if it's obviously kind of disrupting a lot the way we generate images in a moment in a society that is purely visual, that is consuming information mostly through our eyes. Uh, this is another example from my dear friend Voltron um, saying portraits of Muppet people in a scene directed by Spike Jones, Brian K. And you can see some of the examples here, um, beautiful. And of course, the evolution of all these technologies is so fast. In You can see here in one year we have come from like these very abstract somehow paintings into something that looks like a render from an architecture studio. And this is by writing the right sentence, right? Uh, so of course we started to experiment how we could use this technology to create information artifacts and information devices, right? And we started to see, okay, what will happen if we created a manga pie chart uh, with data visualization, right? Or if we create the statistics and an infographic over a, a mountain with uh, with mist, right? And what will happen uh, if we want to really control the sizes of each thing? So, for example, here we're creating visualizations of the garbage intake um, in a in a beach in Indonesia, and and then it transforms into this, right? So it's becoming something that can be really really useful for the kind of work we do. As as you have seen before, we are already working in ways to manifest information in a way that is both informative, but it have this tangible and the granularity of the material as a as another layer of information right so for doing so we started to experiment and, and research a lot on on the ways we express prompts and the ways we can generate images so we started from this idea of a blue cube and we started to create like this whole report on how different words will affect the images that we were creating and we started, of course, using very objective things like materials, right? What will happen with different models if we use the word gold on a blue cube or wood or turtle shell or ice um, or different photographic techniques, right? Lomography, Polaroid, camera phone, disposable camera. But then we turn into something that was a bit more complex. That is, what will happen if we start asking for subjective things? What if we ask for moods, right? Like disappointed right or satisfied how this comes to life in an image 
made, made of patterns, right? And the same with value, what is worthless, very cheap, cheap, austere, precious. Right? And through all this research, we started to discover like the huge and gigantic biases in which these models were trained. Um, a good, uh, a good investigator and a good researcher, and this is Federico Bianchi. He did like this small uh, kind of visualization of what will happen when you write on Dali the OpenAI uh, model, an exotic person, a terrorist or an illegal person. You can obviously see the extremely biased uh, perspective that it have. But when I saw, when I first saw this, this representation, I, it was the first time I thought for myself, this by itself is a data visualization. Um, artificial intelligence, generative artificial intelligence, both for text, natural language models, and image generation, they are like truly very good image representations, but um, data visualizations of the databases in which they have been trained. And when you go to the to the backend, to the to the database, you start to realize which values, ideas, and and cultural and visual culture imagery these databases are using. Right. So for for these models, most of the data fits from from United States, more than sixty percent. Then the second country is Germany. Right. I think it was over 25% um, from Germany. So what we started to see is uh, a space of research on the, on the bias of these models. And, and for doing so, we said, that what will happen if we inverted the process of the algorithm? So normally you will write a blue cube and then the algorithm will transform that into an image of a blue cube. But if we wanted to see the wall through the eyes, through the bias the eyes, of, of this model, we wanted to reverse that process, right? And say, okay, I will bring you an image and I want to, I, I want you to write what do you see, right? So for doing so, we did several experiments. Some of them were with very old um, paintings. Uh, this is uh, um, a classic painting uh, from Jericho, is the Raft of Medusa, and it was painting after the Napoleonic Wars. It's a very political chart. Um, painting because it was painted after the French, well, a French royal naval ship broke apart uh, on West Africa, and and the French captain decided to leave most of the tripulation, like 147 men already, um, in the middle of the sea, just with a raft. Uh, from all of them, only 15 survived, and and it was somehow this painting was a kind of a critique to the to the establishment of that time. And, and I wanted to see like truly what an artificial intelligence will read from that image. And I started to chop some areas of the image to see what was going to happen. And this was one of the images that it was fitted to the artificial intelligence. And this was the concept that it extracted from it. It said a painting of a group of naked, uh, naked men by Theodore Jericho, until here all good. He's wearing a red neckerchief, calling someone on a smartphone, right? So you start to see something that is a bit weird like then you can see clash of clans or even jeffrey epstein right and the calling someone of, on a smartphone it is mainly because from the database of, of of this model most of the images that it have seen whenever someone was like this was um leaving their 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 face on on their hand it was because they were calling someone right so the we can see that the, the models are biased, but not only biased uh, through certain political perspective, but are specifically biased also from the history, from the present moment. We cannot read the past with the models that we have today because they are very much influenced by our own perspectives. Right? And of course, um, OpenAI and so many others are trying to reduce bias. Uh, this was a press release that they did July last year. And, and, and you can see like, part of the work that they have done. Uh, this is what will come up when you write a photo of a CEO. And after the press release was um, released, uh, you could see like a much more diverse um, imagery. And, and still, I don't know exactly how they have done that. Um, but there are like several hypotheses as they don't have, as they have not disclosed the information on that. One of them is that they are doing prompt injection. That means that they are trying to tweak the prompt 
So it always looks diverse with certain um, requests, right? So it's not changing the database, it's not changing the basis of the problem, it's changing actually the outcome of it. And of course, it, this brings a, a lot of debate on what will happen with models when you ask the same thing, but with different words, right? Um, and, and this has a lot to do with something that happens in the same way with uh, NLPs and, and ChatGPT and BART and Bing and all these and all these different like models and tools that is the problem of universal voice. Um, like our generation has grown to search for information in a browser based device, right? In an artifact, in a place where you will write something which is the best jazz player in the world. And then you will send that request into Firefox or into Google, and then you will receive thousands of potential answers. You will be able to decide which answers you want to believe. Right? You will click in several of them and then extract your own conclusions. Um, since the advent of Siri and, and Alexa, for example, we started to have like this problem of universal voice. That is, it was because it was using this very um, basic and, and intuitive way of interacting, that is a conversational design. Um, we only receive one, an one answer. So whenever you ask which is the best play just player, um, of the world to Siri or Alexa, they will give you an option. The same will happen with ChatGPT. Generally, they will give you an option. And that's like really bad because subconsciously you are forgetting about all the other options that you had when you were searching on a browser. Um, this is part of the research that we are doing and trying to find out the ways to break this idea of universal voice, understanding that you can choose several other things when asking or creating a request. And for example, just asking, hey, don't give, me, don't give me just one answer, but give me three potential answers of that will actually deploy a much more safer uh, space for biases like this. Um, and focusing on, on the second topic I wanted to talk today is probabilistic fiction and probabilistic stories. Um, this came up from as part of an exhibition that we were doing on, on feminism in Spain. And, and it was a whole exhibition. And at the very end of the exhibition, we created uh, this installation. And, and Marta, the creative director, was really um, focused in, in, in explaining that all the statistics and all the data that we were showing through the exhibition was at the very end confronting and, and creating a huge damage into specific people and, 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 and it was uh, surrounded by true stories. So we created this installation filled up with uh, 14 different thermal printers and each of the thermal printers were uh, segmented by different ages. Right? And we were asking everyone that passed by uh, this room, what have you had to leave because of sexism? Right? And people could scan a QR code and send their answer and their age and, and through that, we were creating like this huge cascade of stories, this waterfall of stories that were filling up the room at the very end of the exhibition. It was even like going out of the exhibition and these stories were really, really hard, some of them. Uh, you could see here, when I was 15, a man of the hotel staff followed me into the bathroom, not allowing me to exit the room before taking a photo of me. Um, and you could see like stories that were really, really hard and, and emotional. Some, things, some of them were very violent. And it ended up becoming something as like the most, um, the, the, the room of the whole exhibition where the people will spend most of the time. Right? And after the exhibition, almost we, we recollected over 4,000 um, answers from these stories. And we were approached at, as this was part of an exhibition from the, um, from the um, um, government, they asked us to, to create a report on that exhibition and the survey that we have been doing. But we wanted to protect the, um, we wanted to protect the anonymity of, of the people participating in it. So we didn't want to share this information. And, and we did like a first experiment that was analyze all the stories that the people sent and try to locate them. I find where these stories were happening, if they were happening at home, the street, work, during night, in a party, which people were involved in these stories and, and which feelings 
were involved and which actions happened through these different stories, right? Uh, but when we saw like all these statistics and uh, we saw all these numbers, we said, well, this is not a quite good representation of, of the stories that we were explaining because these stories were very touching. And when the people passed by, they really understood it from a very one-to-one -one perspective. They understood that there was a person behind this number. So we started to think, okay, how we can share specific stories, stories that move, but at the same time, visualize this information, make visible that most of the stories happen at home. And this is when we started to experiment with this idea of a community bias visualizer. And what we did uh, was to train, retrain a GPT-3 model with all these stories. And we were segmenting different models depending on the age of the stories. And then we started to recreate stories, to ask for new stories. And we started to see which stories were happening. We were creating uh, artificial personas that were talking about experiences that were based in the 4,000 stories, right? So we were creating patterns from the stories that we had um, feeded into the algorithm. And we started to show things that in the statistics we were not able to see. Right. We started to show how at the very end there was always a position of power in these stories and how they were pointing out certain positions. Uh, we were starting to see that there were patterns in different ages. So, for example, older uh, people from older ages were pointing out stories um, that were much more violent, uh, while uh, people that were younger and, and the model that we trained with the younger generation, uh, with the younger um, information, the stories that it took were much more focused on language, were much much more focused on subtleties uh, from the perspective and the manifestation of sexism that were as well as important as the others, right? And, and somehow from there we started to realize that how we could create a process in which we could collect data, quantitative facts, and we could, could cross over that with qualitative, like the emotional perspective of a specific stories, process that in what we call the data stories, and create a space where we could both look at the eyes of a person that is telling a specific story, still protecting the specific story, true story of someone, creating this anonymity and creating a story that can talk for over 4,000 people, right? And, and this was uh, for us a, a, a perspective or a question that we ask ourselves, how can we transform AI into something that can build collective empathy? How can we use bias? And how, if bias is a feature of artificial intelligence, how can we use it positively to create biases that can actually help us comprehend and create uh, bridges of empathy and connection with certain collectives, right? And of course, this build up like uh, a new space for interesting mm -hmm. ideas, understanding that um, in terms of stories, we have from forensic story to a fiction, right? In this axis of, of stories. And then we have a historical accounts and on the other side, inspired by true events. And we have probabilistic uh, stories right in the middle right a space where we are using like truly historical accounts and, and and stories from real people but then we are creating a fiction from these stories based on the accumulative information that we have gathered and as part of this research of understanding how we could use artificial intelligence on 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 reconstruction and, and probabilistic fictions we started another project that was called synthetic memories and, and this first came up as after uh, part of our experience in Athens a few years ago in 2013, when we just started working, there was uh, one of the biggest uh, refugee crises in, in Europe and, and specifically Greece was receiving most of these uh, refugees. And, and we were there helping some of civil society organizations. And I remember very well how um, in, a, in a dinner with one of the families, one a grandmother told to me and said, well, I'm a refugee now, but my grandkids will be refugees for a long time because we have lost our homes, we have lost our neighborhoods, but we have all also lost our photo albums. Like oh, the visual heritage of my family is gone because during this migratory process, we have to leave all these things um, back. So this took me 
for a certain time until um, in the last year, I started to, to see how we could use generative models to create images from these lost memories and create um, historical accounts, even if they were recreations from the words of, of the generation that was living. Right? And we started doing that here in Barcelona. We started these initial tri trials uh, working with people all, older than 75. And for example, this is Maria. We were doing this interview and it was it worked like in a very simple way. We had a prompter, we had an interviewer and the interviewee. And for example, Mar we first started asking, OK, what, which is the first memory that you ever remember? And, and she said, well, my first memory is was when I was a kid, I, I used to go to this balcony. My, my mother will rent a balcony in front of the prison because my father uh, was in prison because the dictatorship in Spain. He was a political prisoner. So the only way we could see each other was through the window of the prison and the balcony of, of a, a family from Barcelona. And uh, we started to reconstruct that image, right? And we started to say, okay, so how was, um, how do you remember your mother uh, her? Or what, what were you uh, wearing? In which part of Barcelona was this happening, right? And we started not only to recreate the image itself, but, but even the other side of the street with his father in it. Right? And it was so heavy, the impact, to seeing Maria respond to, to that image, and not only the image, but the video itself. That we said, okay, we have something here. And she, she pointed out, she said, well, this is very similar to how I remember because I cannot see a specific Im image. I have something such as kind of a blurry image in, in my head. It's more like a dream. Um, so this idea of, of, of creating an image that is not very well defined worked very well uh, for her. And we start to do like this project to create synthetic memories with several people. We started to work with different uh, nurse homes here in Barcelona on the reconstruction of memories and trying to understand how all these memories could be built up just from the from the accounts and from the words that they were using. And every time we created a, a, an image, we will show and they will say, OK, no, the, maybe it was a bit different. The clothes were a bit different or this machine was a bit different. And we have been recreating like histories from several people, no more, more than 40 different people that have passed by. and. Right now, we are working specifically in nurse homes as we realized that, that this was very connected to a kind of therapy that is happening already in several nurse homes all over the world that is called the reminiscence therapy. And this therapy is specifically used for, uh, with, for people with dementia and specifically with Alzheimer. And, and probably you have seen like this classic video of an old lady um, that is very disconnected and unexpectedly someone plays some music and she reconnects, right? And this is specifically because um, there is such a visceral impact, electrical impact in their brain because she is reconnecting with something from her past that for a while, for a certain uh, minutes, uh, she regains certain cognitive abilities, right? So we have realized that with synthetic memories, with our first uh, an early experiment, something very similar happens. And we are starting to build up the body of work, of academic work, to see how this could have a potential impact on memory recreation with people of dementia. Um, this somehow that kind of crosses over like certain like different fields from the artistic perspective to the academic and research one and the medical one to the social one. Right? And uh, this is where actually we want to point out the discussion on artificial intelligence that is everyone is talking about artificial intelligence. Everyone wants to do things with artificial intelligence. But the question is why we have to. Right? It's not about what to create or how to create it, but why we do it, right? If artificial intelligence is the answer, what is the question that we are asking ourselves, right? And which are the priorities in which we want to use this technology uh, in the future? And that was all. Thank you very much. And thank you. And I will be open for questions now. Thank you so much, Pau, for, for all this. Uh, really inspiring. Uh, I will uh, let me try to first uh, give our colleagues 
access to the microphone and to the camera. Just give me one second here. And so uh, I would like to give now our audience a chance to ask you questions. And so please, if you have questions for Paul, uh, raise your hand. And while we wait for some of the questions, um, I I would probably like to ask a question myself, and then I hand over to the the first person. Um, so so the UN here at the, uh, the UN Statistics Division, uh, we also have a group who works on on big data and data science, um, and we have uh, also we have. Uh, some work on uh, what we call privacy enhancing technologies. So uh, how can we basically give access to to individual data or to to micro data to the public, but with protecting really the uh, actual the actual uh, data? Um, what do you think? Or how do you think could artificial intelligence help us uh, on that path? Uh, we we have also something called uh, synthetic data. Uh, so so how do you see approaches that you have been using in maybe um, presenting data in a new way? I, I think the first step for such a big organization and with such an impact and reach is to create a lot of didactics on the use of artificial intelligence and more in units like uh, statistics and focus on machine learning. So I think um, the even before the starting deploying the technology, we truly need to explain how it works, right? And what is behind and what is needed and what are the biases, the dangers, the limitations, right? Um, so I think um, from UN offices, one of the first things to do is to start working on frameworks and guidelines for an ethical and responsible use of AI in state service and, and, and best practices, right? And there are already like, I think, good cases or case studies that you could use as, okay, this has been a good case. This has been certainly a, a case that has not worked at all. Um, so I will start from there. Then I think right now, like this idea of probabilistic stories are is, is kind of a, a new field of, of the game is something that gives is a, a, a way to visualize information with a lot of granularity, but also with a lot of, of, of dangers that we have not explored yet, right? So I think it's more a space of an experimental research than sp still a space of application, right? So it, it cannot be used as a tool to solve a problem yet, but as a tool to complement perspectives, right? It's a tool to better comprehend something. When you have done like all the standard research, maybe you could use um, semantic and probabilistic research um, using artificial intelligence to see other perspectives on, on the same database. Right? This well, one of the, the ideas I've got on that, even though I'm, I'm not a, an expert on, <laughs> on how to deploy that on a state level. <laughs> Thank you, Pao. Uh, so again, uh, please, everyone, if you have a question for Pao, uh, raise your hand. I see Stephen wants to come in. Stephen, please go ahead. Okay, th thanks, thanks very much for your presentation. Uh, uh, I have the AI on my phone. Usually, I pull some questions and then it give me response. But mostly I get to know that some of those responses, like take for typical example, sometimes mathematical statistics questions, when I post it for it to solve, it gives me answers. And those answers, mostly they are not correct. I really want to know how AI and, 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 and generate these answers. Are they digging into other people's solutions or they are producing their own solution? Sometimes their answers are correct. Or sometimes they're wrong. So I really want to know are they digging into other solutions or they are producing their own answers? That's my that's my question. And can, can you repeat the, the, the question itself? I, I didn't hear well. Okay. Okay, let me 
let, let me lay the pieces first, right? I say I have AI install on my phone, and I uh, sometimes use it for study and, and sometimes post questions, let's say in mathematics or statistics questions for solving. Usually, sometimes it gives some answers that are correct, some answers are wrong. But my question here is how are they, how AI generating these questions? This, this, so how AI generating the solution to this problem? Are they using their own solution or they are taking into other people's solutions to give to new solutions? Yeah, well, so um, it, it's a probabilistic model. So the in this case, for example, ChatGPT doesn't know that two plus two is four. What it knows is that in most of the accounts of its database, every time that you have write two plus two, 99.9999% of the times, the answer is four, right? So it doesn't have a logic or a conscious or anything behind it. It's it just a probabilistic that this will happen. And what happens is when whenever you ask more complex and more complex and more complex problems, the probability of uh, error it starts to become bigger, even though there are certain models that are starting to be very, very, very good and very, like, really, really good at predicting solutions to mathematical or statistical problems, right? Um, so this is something that is evolving super fast because if you compare how uh, GPT-2 or GPT-3 were reacting to the same problems that we are giving to GPT-4, uh, it's nothing, like, nothing to do. And I'm sure GPT-5 will be able to like give you like really, really good answers like this. Still, when people say that this is intelligent, at least it's not the kind of intelligence that we used to understand. Right? Thank, thanks, Pau. Um, let me hand over to another uh, colleague here on the call, uh, Vera Dragovic. Uh, Vera, please come in. Uh, hello, and thank you for pronouncing my last name correctly. And nice meeting you all this way. I don't know <laughs> I don't know whether to ask this question uh, after you've told me that chat GPT does not know that two plus two is four, but it thinks that it probably is. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Hi, I work for UNHCR in uh, in the Balkans, and you did mention the refugees. Uh, I have uh, two questions. One concerns you, the name of your organization. What's domestic in data streamers? Is it that you try to use non-US data since you mentioned that 60% of data feeding the AI is from the US or is it something else? And uh, in the very interesting, the research in uh, therapy of Alzheimer's potential using generative uh, synthetic memories, as you call them, that 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 was very very interesting. Are are, are you involving medical experts? Uh, oh, you're nodding. Okay. And uh, do you think uh, since you mentioned uh, refugees, you know that refugees most of them come with different kinds of trauma. Um, do you think there's a potential in uh, not just tackling Alzheimer but using AI to help uh, uh, resolve traumas? especially since we know that mental health is a very expensive um, business and that the donors are exhausting uh, uh, funds for mental health aid. Thank you. And yeah. sorry if that that's too many questions. <laughs> I, I will try to oh, answer all of them. Maybe I, I leave one. If, if I do, just ask me again. Um, on the first one, the models, most of the models that we are using today are like really biased towards an American pers westernized perspective and American perspective a lot. Um, but then you can refine them. You can retrain them with the specific data. That means that you can rebias, right? So if you have a lot of data from a specific sector or, po or population, you can use this data to transform that algorithm into something that feels closer, right? So th that was the first. Um, on the second one, um, with refugees, we started working with them long ago on specifically communicating certain realities um, in refugee camps. And after that, we learned from this, this technology and we said, okay, what will happen if we cross and we start using this technology um, in these spaces? Because the kind of work we were doing was setting up English schools in Greece. 
right? So, or educational programs and stuff like this. So uh, what we realized is that they were talking a lot about the past and the future, but they didn't have a lot of tools to visualize them. So this could become potentially something that was really cheap and and really easy to per, to use in in certain in certain factor in certain spaces because of course most of 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 uh, the refugees in these camps uh, specifically in Europe they have internet access and they have a phone and they can do it from the phone directly right so we contacted two of the biggest uh, refugee organizations in Greece to start collecting information how that could be deployed the idea is to start this program next year in February and and the test we have done has been done in like very specific uh, small groups within our area of knowledge of people that we have met through our uh, past projects and in terms of the project we, that we have done with alzheimer we have been working of course with uh, medical advice and with uh, professionals on on um, neuropsychology that is specifically actually is the the, the biggest expert on, on reminiscent therapy in Spain on neuropsychology. And of course, this is a very, like, let's say, a new thing for everyone, like really from the medical centers, they are amazed from the nurse homes, the caregivers, they are amazed. And but at the same time, we are trying to do it very slowly to do very like cautious steps because we don't want to release uh, a toolkit for everyone to use because it can be used in like really bad way. Like you can start recreating memories that has not happened. You, there are a lot of dangers that we should point out first. So we are creating now like a series of guidelines and the idea is that we deploy the, all this knowledge and all these tools into organizations that are, that are already or have already the technical and, and ethical um, guidelines and follow the ethical guidelines to use this kind of technology because if you release that like for free for everyone to use it can it can get into a lot of trouble muchas gracias <laughs> <De nada. laughs> thank you uh, so i see also uh etlam abrera has the hand up uh, please come in Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. And thank you for that uh, really interesting presentation. I'm joining you from UN Habitat. So this is the agency that works on urban planning and cities. And the link here for us is smart cities and the application of, you know, tech, tech solutions, digital solutions in the context of cities for urban living. Uh, an urban context. So I really enjoyed your presentation um, and I wanted to ask two questions or one is more or less a comment. It's interesting how you say that um, there is a possibility to rebalance the biases, right? To rebias the biases that go into the feeds that um, um, that AI uh, relies on. But my question there would be as follows: In order to rebalance or rebias these systems and be able to feed into it, you know, more contextually relevant or diverse information, you need to have that information in the first place. Mm -hmm. Initial conditions and inequalities in terms of data availability and data poverty across different regions, across different actors, mean that some actors, some regions, some countries will have inevitably better initial conditions and information and data to feed into these systems whereas others may not. So in a sense, I feel like initial inequities and inequalities in data availability, information availability will um, be in a way perpetuated in this, in this context of artificial intelligence because of those initial inequities. So interested to hear from you because, you know, when we work globally, we work in many data poor contexts. So just interested to hear from you on that. The second, um, um, piece is okay. So, so AI relies a lot on feeds from the past, what already exists, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But how relevant is it also to look forward based on the past, and how robust do you think that can be in terms of projecting forward? Um, you know, a few decades ahead, based on what the system um, is fed. So. Just interested in those two uh, questions, but otherwise, we I, I really like your message to us that 
a, a very important role for the United Nations is in terms of those guidelines around ethics, privacy, rights, etc. And I can assure your colleagues would also do the same that this conversation is happening right now. It's a big topic. It's a big conversation at the UN. And it's good to hear that, you know, the reaffirmation from from other parts that this is the recognized role um, for the UN in, the, in this uh, process. Thank you. Thank you, Adlam. Um, on the first question, it's certainly true. Like there are differences and there is um, place like it's already happening and, and, and artificial intelligence is biased towards the United States perspective because it has more information, more data, right? Um, and this will keep happening. Like this is not going to change. This may be able to rebalance. It's already happening. So there are a lot of uh, experimental models that only use, for example, information um, in certain languages and, and these models react differently. Right. It have a different perspective. They speak differently, even when they translate them into English, like the behavior is very different, right? Because it has been trained within like the context of a different uh, um, information framework. Um, still, I think that should not be a, a limitation or a wall for the use of this technology in certain areas, because otherwise you are actually creating even a bigger difference. Right. If you are only using artificial intelligence tools in, in data rich countries, you are creating even a bigger gap between them two. Right. What we have to use is the potential that we create in these rich, um, data rich countries um, and understand which are the biases and the implicit biases that can cause in other contexts. Right. Um, this is called multi-stability from an academic perspective, and I, I love the concept when I first read. That is the idea that um, this first happened with uh, Tinder. They created this amazing application from a very Silicon Valley perspective where you could find the love of your life from your pocket. But what happened was that when they started globalizing this application, they started to recognize certain problems. Like, for example, in Ukraine, uh, LGBTQ communities were actually um, prosecuted using um, Tinder. So they were actually hunted by certain uh, collectives using Tinder to actually go against them. Right. This is what happens when you use a technology, a technology from certain contexts in another one. I think that is exactly what can happen with artificial intelligence if it's not already happening. Um, but now we have already certain certain advantages that we know which are these biases and these are very easy to spot. Like the biases within the models today are like really, really like easy. And, and there are already like six or seven big companies that are working on, on mo model algorithmic auditory. So this is starting to be an important business, both in the United States, but here in Europe too. And I'm sure um, this will start to become something even more important when it's not only about the audit uh, auditing these algorithms, but about creating a solution on the databases, right? And, and for me, Going back to the example I gave on OpenAI and how they solved the problem with a prompt injection for the CEO image, um, I think there are several ways we can solve these problems. All the, like the problems can be solved without like the need of creating a, a huge database. Maybe it's specifically about creating certain synthetic um, data or synthetic information that can drive certain answers closer to the group and the and the qualitative information that we have over a specific collective or community and again i'm 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 just guessing and when we are talking about a decade from now it's very difficult for me to imagine because in the last two years a lot has happened so i, I think there will be a, a huge disruption like this is already a huge disruption and i'm more relaxed now because i'm seeing that it's not a problem of big institutions that they are going a bit slowly, but also companies like companies are integrating these tools in a very slow way. And, and this is something that I at first I was saying, OK, in two weeks, Nike, um, Apple or these companies will be using AI every day from all the company. And it's not happening like uh, like we have talked with all these companies and they are still learning how to use. And it's a process that will it will be slower than 
what it has been announced, that the hype of this will change the world tomorrow. No, it won't be tomorrow. It will happen slowly and by steps. It will change it probably, but in, in a more slow way. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Edlam, for this question. Uh, well, an hour has passed already. It's it's amazing. Time flies. Uh, really such an amazing presentation and a lot of food for thought. Um, I would like to thank you once more, Paul. Uh, I would like also to invite everyone on this call if you can turn your camera on just for a second and uh, to give a little bit of a face to the audience that we have. So please turn on your camera and turn on your mics and please give Pau a big round of applause for this. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much, Pau. Thank uh, you. We We'll share the recording of your uh, talk of, of this uh, webinar today on the Global Network of Data Officers and Statisticians. We will also upload it to YouTube, to our YouTube channel. Uh, so uh, please, colleagues, feel free to share it with your colleagues, whoever is interested in it. Thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks a lot, Pao. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Goodbye. -bye.